Okay, uh, let's see, I've got sound. All right, this is gonna be part two of week six last night. As I promised you, I'm gonna go over chapter seven. And uh, we, we covered chapter seven to, to a certain extent. And I'm, I, I think that I, I got everything out of there that we could want to take a look at. Now, as far as work that's due, we did lunches, I did, I did lunches six in the screencast last week. And there is also this file, which you can use to upload if you did not follow along with me in terms of what, in, in terms of ch chapter six, which covered, covered the creation of tables. And again, just to bring these to your attention. Now, this business about how to, an how to access SAS Visual Analytics, it's, it's, it's a PDF file and it's basically okay, but I'm, I'm gonna take us back again and I'm gonna walk us through it real quickly because you're gonna have an assignment that comes from there. So it's at Teradata University, Teradata University Network, there are. Now you'll have to register. Okay, and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, put myself in here. Sign in. And it's thinking. So you'll need to go to Teradata University Network and register. As I said, because later in the course, I have an assignment for you using SAS Visual Analytics. The PDF that's over there and um, and uh, Canvas should work. Now I wanted to note that bring your attention to something. I spoke about this last night, but we'll just, I'll make sure that you're certain. The student password is analytics. So when you want to log in over there as a student, register and so forth, You'll want to ha you'll need that password, okay? And I'll get the annotation up here. Here we go. Eraser. Boom. Okay. Now, again. I'm just gonna take you through this briefly. And that PDF that's there in, in um, the PDF that, that is there in Canvas will take you through to a certain extent, but you're gonna to come to some, you're gonna to come to a point where you have uh, about getting Insight toy uh, and, and looking at it that may or may not be available to all of you although it is for me, but I'm gonna go ahead and go through this again, just to make sure that we're all on target. You come in, you, you register, and then you come over and you log in, and you click on software. Okay. And you scroll down and you'll find SAS Visual Analytics. Okay, now as, as, as I said last night, and as I showed you in the PDF, sometimes it's a little bit slow, okay?
Here's a fact about SAS, which probably would be a good idea for you to take a look at. Here's a getting started guide. And here, uh, here are some course contents. There's some data dictionaries. And here's the user guide, guide for us, some information about SAS, the company. And we'll click on SAS Visual Analytics and it'll get us to the analytics module. Now, how fast it loads is dependent upon traffic and a whole set of other factors. It loaded pretty fast here for me today, um, this morning, but it last night it was took it some time. Once you're over here, okay, and I'm just kind of going back through what we we talked about. If you see uh, the data admin project for fall. 16, that's okay. Um, and you could try to do some things with that. I'm going to have to take a look at that assignment and, and uh, probably redo it or have some try to try to probably try to redo it. Um, and they have uh, this is a project I did from fall 16. Here's a, and let's look at this base exploration. You have to add the Adobe Flash Player a lot. It's gonna load up now. And up here at the top, you see that it says, select a data source and there's shared data. There's that project from uh, last semester. This is a, an export that we did. And let's click on browse and we can see what's there. And there's that data admin um, project from fall 16. And we have some my folder, now let's check industry samples. And you'll see some exploration from different industries. And probably what I'll have you do is, is work with them. But let's explore this for just a second. And we'll open up the one for banking. I'll see what we've got in there. Let's try the communications. Goodness, they don't have anything in there. I thought they would. There's the products. Let's see if there's any shared data. Something on healthcare there. Let's look at this. We'll cancel that off for just a minute. And let's try this, let's select a data source and see what we've got. Okay, click sec, let me cancel this for a minute. You wanna go back and you wanna click select a data source, okay? And in the example, in the, in the, um, in the assignment that I have loaded there for you and then 
Um, also in the directions, I have you look at an Insight Toy Company. And here I want you to look at Insight Toy Company. It was 2012. Here's the ins or, or 217. Here's the Insight Toy Demo. Okay. And let's look at it for a minute. I'm just gonna love the toy demo. There we are. And now you can do you can you can do an exploration and you can run the queries and things I'm gonna ask you to do. Okay. And I'll update that. So we have I have an assignment. So you will be able to work with Insight Toys. And I'm going to click this off for a minute and we'll leave. And again, I'll just, once you've logged in, I'm just going to walk you through the process again. Once you've walked, once you've logged into Teradata and registered, then the password for students is analytics. You'll go, you'll click on software. You'll come over here to uh, ac uh, access the, the SAS Visual Analytics module. And it loads, like I said, like I've told you all, so in that directions, it's gonna take you a little bit of time. This is fast today. The traffic's not real heavy like it was last night. And then we're gonna click on Data Explorer. Okay, then click select a data source. And hopefully, um, I would think that you would, should be able to get the Insight Toy Company data. And there it is. And you can do the Insight Toy Demo. and do the work that I ask you to do as that major project involving SAS, okay? So I think that's enough information there and I'll, I'll be repeating that, but I'm gonna close this exploration off and then I'm gonna go up here and do Teradata and I'm gonna log out, okay? All right, now, as I mentioned, the Lunches 6 database, Lunches 6 is due on Friday. Here's the Lunches database 6 file I created, or you could follow along what I did in the screencast part two last week, okay? Now, and I also alerted you to these resources that are here. And I want you to take a look at them. On the 8th of October, lunches database seven and eight are due, okay? So, I have files there for you to upload for the workshop credit. And I talked us through seven last night, but I'm gonna go ahead and download this file. We talked about seven last night, and like I said, you've got this file here as a backup file, so you've got something to turn in. And I do want you to look at these anyway. Okay. And then lunches database nine, seven, eight, and nine are all due next week. And I have 
files for you, i.e. completed files that you can look at and turn in, okay? I'll erase all those there. Now I'm going to go ahead and open up seven and eight and nine and, and take a look at them. Now again, you'll go through the process, you know, of downloading this file to your desktop rename it and then upload it for the credit. So we're gonna look at this and I'm gonna open it up and then download it. This is for lunches database seven. And I'm gonna take the file, save it as a database. And I'm gonna put it on my desktop Seven, and I'll put Harmon Keith. And then we can take a look at it. Now, as I said last night, I want to reiterate this. Um, you do have the option to come in yourself and work through some of the code on these. It's important also for you to take the book and look and follow through chapter seven so that you get the content there. And it talks about formats, sequences, and indexes. So I'm gonna take a look in here and I'll find some of these that are, that are labeled as seven and some queries, okay? So I'm going to, uh, here's seven dash eighteen number three, and I'll okay. And seven eighteen number three. Um, is over on page 279 in the textbook, and it's where we're inserting uh, some data into that uh, 0718 my days, I'm putting in a birth date. And I'm appending the row to it. Okay, now let's go into the design view and look at this, this query. And here we are, we're going to insert into, and I'll just size this up so we can see it. And let me go over here and I get a Word doc open. to make it a lot easier to see. Okay. We insert it into the table 0718 underscore my uh, underscore then my underscore days. And we inserted uh, and then my underscore event dash my underscore date. And those are the fields right here in the parentheses. And then the values, the birth date, and then the date January 16, 1971. Notice the date format for Access Excel, Access SQL. We use the pound signs here. And so I'll go back up and I'll take a look and I'm gonna find that table. 0718. 
So let's go find that table 0718, unless we, unless we threw it into a query. Well, we'll take a look here. Oh, 708. There it is. 07, 07, uh, 18. I'm sorry. My days. And let's open it up. And there's birth date, college graduation, wedding, birth date. Okay. So we did an insert. In fact, all on page 279, that's just a series of, well, the first two are altering a table that, creating the table 0718 my days. And then, the set now the next one that's on page 279 we altered the table okay so we created the table then we altered it and then we begin to insert data into the table now obviously as i've said before that's why we create a form so we can put data in without having to write a bunch of insert statements there at the bottom of page two to uh, 79, you're gonna see the result table, okay? I'm gonna close this off, and we'll close this one. And let's just click back up here on the shutter bar and let's look at uh, queries. And we'll scroll down to find any sevens. Here's 718 number four. I'll go to the design view and here's another insert statement. That's over on page 279. Then 718 number five. That design view. And we're putting it in the wedding. This is his wedding date. And he doesn't do, we don't do number 16. Okay, now I want you to notice something. As you look at these queries, notice the icon. That's telling you that you're running a query where you're appending or inserting data. And see, this goes hot up here, up in the, up in the uh, toolbar. You can see it's giving you the feedback. So, so far, so good. Now, chapter eight, deals with data integrity. And the authors talk about using check constraints at the bottom of page 283. And they show us the code from Oracle, but then they show us how to do it using the access GUI, okay? So uh, we're going to to sectional 802 foods. We'll go to that table. And I'm just going to do a quick search here. Save myself some if I can. Not going to let me do the F function. Okay. I'll close these two off. And now we're here looking for the 08. And I may have 
Yeah. That, so I'm going to need to take us over into the see the tables. Let's look at the queries. Okay, I had five and six and seven mixed here, so I'm going to close this off. And of course, we had just downloaded this lunches DB. And that's what you'll turn in for seven. I'm gonna go back here for a minute. Let's take a look at what we're gonna do for chapter eight. Okay. And here is a file for you to upload. Lunch is DB8. I'll download it. And I'll enable the content. And then, I'm gonna, and then I'm going to save this. Lunch is DB8. I'm D, D88, it's actually, it's DB8. Harmon, Keith, on my desktop. And we'll open up and take a look at it, okay? We're, in, we're going to be over in chapter eight, and this is ensuring data integrity. And he talks about it over there on page 284. You can, the code for Oracle uh, to add a constraint and a check. Now, if you take a look at the bottom page 284, they show you how it's done in Access GUI. So we're gonna to go to that table there, section 0802 foods. And there it is. We'll open it up in design view. Okay. Now we're gonna come down to price. We're gonna click on price. And I want you to take a look at the field properties, okay? And as you come down here, here's the, cons here's the validation rule. The price must be less than $10, equal to or, or less than $10. And here's a validation text. A and what that, and what that basically says is the price must be, pardon me, the price must be less than $10. And if they enter a price of $10 or more, it's going to say price exceeds $10 and it won't let you complete the record unless you put in a price that's less than $10. Okay. And so you can do it in the field properties there in the graphic user interface, like we talked about before. Okay. Now, They talk about unique constraints using unique indexes. We talked about that quite a bit last night about, um, and you look there on page 286 and you're gonna see that in the textbook where they go into that 0803 employees table. We'll open that up. And we'll find the, here it is, the 0803 employees and we'll open that up in design view. And there they show you at the at the phone number. We'll click on phone number. Okay. And you'll see that down there at the bottom it says yes, it's indexed, no duplicates. And that means everybody has their own unique phone number. And that's what this is what we call a unique index. Again, we're doing this in the um, we're doing this in the, in access, in the, in the graphic user interface, in, in the design view of the table, 
most commercial products today, if you're the DB administrator or you have the, uh, the, the authority, you can come in and work with tables like this without having to write code. But there are those times when people in Oracle will have to write code to get some of these things done. But the most commercial products at that level for a DB administrator are gonna have some type of interface like this, okay? Um, now, over on page 387, authors cover, cover yet another critical piece of data integrity. And that's dealing with the elimination of nulls, nulls, N-U-L-L-S, the not null constraint. He talks about it at the top of page 80, 287, and he shows you in that table 0804 lunches. So let's go down here to the 0804 lunches and let's go to design view. Now we have, we have data integrity starting with a primary key. So we have, and that's indexed, all right? And then we're gonna come down and look at employee ID, click on that, and you'll see, is it required? You go down to field properties. And yes, it's, a, it's required. And no, and yes, duplicates are okay because you have employees in several kinds of records, i.e., in fact tables, and so you're going to have multi. You're going to have entries for. Uh, you're going to have records uh, for the same employee over and over, multiple times. So you say it's indexed. Yes, duplicates are okay and it's required. So if the employee ID is not entered into this table, okay, then the record won't save, okay? And they show you that there at the bottom of page 287. I'll go ahead and just here for you. And here's the employee ID. We make it, because we make the employee ID required, that prevents us from having null values. This is a nice time and I'll repeat it again a little bit later on. There's a big difference between null and zero. Zero is a true property. It's zero, okay? It's part of a numeric scale or, or type of numeric. Uh, it's a number, basically. Null is an empty cell or an empty field in a record. And that drives people crazy. It drives them crazy because one, they don't know if you left it blank on purpose, or two, if it's blank because somebody forgot to enter the data. So you put in a data integrity, you put into a data integrity rule to handle null data, okay? Now I'm gonna take this table for a minute and let me get here and get this stuff erased. And we're gonna go step by step through this and look at the data integrity. Okay, let's I'll click on lunch ID and of course it has a primary key. And I can know that by two ways. First of all, I'll see the little symbol here or I see primary key is hot up here in the toolbar. It's darkened, it's required. So the employee, so the lunch ID is required, it's a number the lunch date. Now here's a case where, if I really wanna be sure about this, 
I'm going to put that it's required. There's no sense in having this lunch date if it's not in, in, in your record, if it's not required. And I'll show you. We'll go back up here. And there are the lunch dates. But easily, if you created a new record, say lunch ID number 23, you could skip putting in the date. So you end up with an empty cell, pardon me, an empty field in your record. So I'd say the lunch date, I'd make it required and come down here to field properties. And I'd put, yes. And it's not indexed, I could if I want to. But it's required. Now we'll go back up top. So you want to save your app and data? Yes. And it says the rules have been changed. You may lose some data. Okay. Let's open this up. If I go to input a record, if I create a form or I come in here to input data, I'm going to have to have the lunch date the record will not save. It's going to be the same thing on the employee ID. On the date entered, no, it's not required. So it, again, I'd want to come in here and make it required. And it'll tell me, hey, you're changing the data integrity rules, which is fine. So if I des decide to add a record here, Okay, I'm going to do this. I'm just going to put in, let's see, this is just an experiment. I'm going to put in 23. Okay. I'm going to skip the date and I'm going to put in employee number 201. Okay. I skipped the lunch date and I'm going to skip the date it was entered. Okay, I'm not going to do anything. And I'm going to save this table. Watch what happens. It's going to tell you, you got to put a value and the lunch is date. Okay. And so I put in a date. And it's not going to let me save this record until I put everything in. And we'll close. And it says you can't save this record at this time. No. Okay. You should never have a field in the table that you don't populate. If you have null data, again, this is a key, this is probably the biggest. Pro this is indeed the biggest problem everybody faces and has. So we've looked at uh, the not null constraint. Then we have the primary key constraint. We talked about that. That's over on page 288. Then we talk about referential integrity. If you take a look at your textbook there on page 290, you're going to see the concept of referential integrity. And notice that we have a lookup table. It's also called a reference table or a parent table. And, it, and it's a list of, of all valid values and these, are and these are primary keys. And then you have a data table. It's also called the child table. And anytime you have a primary key in a, for one table and then it's put into another table, it's called a foreign key. Yeah, and they, and they, they walk you through that piece of making sure that you have referential integrity so that you, you match things. Now they give you an example of that, okay, over on page two, 292. And that's, if you go in there, I think it's gonna be the code and the text 
um, uh, 8 8-8 eight eight, all right and so I'm going to find a query here I can find eight, eight number eight. Now we'll write the code and do it. Eight twelve, eight thirteen. Apparently, I didn't do it, but let's look at this. We're going to alter the table section oh eight oh eight underscore clients. We're going to add a constraint, which will be a primary, which will be a foreign key. And that foreign key, the foreign key comes from the section 0808 clients state table. And then we identify the foreign key as state code and it references section 0808 states, the state code. And we see lookup table, which is the states table. And we'll find it here real quick. And let's see, I think we might, may I would assume I created it, maybe I didn't. There it is. Okay. That's the lookup table. All right. I eat what I call a dimension table. And we're going to take that primary key, which is the state code. And let's go to the design view and we'll see that that is indeed the primary key. And we're gonna execute code to add it into the, this section 0808 clients table. And so we're down to the section 0808 clients table. We'll open it up. And there's the state code. Let's go to the design view. And notice now it is the in the clients table here, you'll see the primary key, but here's the state code buried in there so that we can link tables together. Okay, it's like a lookup table. I'll go up to the data sheet view. I'll close this off for a second. And we were inserting into the client's table. We'll go to the design view in the state code. Now, We can create a true lookup code. Now we've put the state code in there, all right? And we've altered the table and we've added that key so that we have referential integrity between the two tables. Now, if I really want to be sure and I want to protect the input, I'm, I can do this, okay? I'm going to click lookup table. I'm going to click combo box. It says the row source type. I'm on the second row there, table query, and it says the row source. And I'm going to click that. That's that third line, and I'm going to click the three dots. And I'm coming down here to the states table. In the section 808 states.
Okay. I'm going to add that table. I'm going to close it. And I'm going to put in the state name, pardon me, the state code, then the state name, and I'm going to run that. It'll show me the state code and the state name. And now I'm through this. I'll save it. Yes. And notice here's the code for the row source. Now I'm going to have one bound column. I'm going to have two, uh, two columns under here. No column headings. And the column widths will be one inch, semicolon, one inch. And I'll go above. I'll say, well, I want to save this. Yes. Now, let's take a look at the state code. And you click in here, and you'll see something nice. You see the lookup table now. I can make sure I have the right code because I've drawn it from the lookup table for states. That's how I maintain referential and integrity because I just simply do that lookup and there it is. Okay. And that's illustrated there at page 292. I just simply added in a lookup table. They have you write the code up there. And that's all there is to it. Over on page 219, uh, and you'll see that there are some, some things that are inserts and updates that are prevented by, by referential, referential integrity. And you look at that, they're in the middle of page 293 and they show you insert into the client's table these values. New York is not part of the state's table. So you can't input somebody from New York because you don't have it as part of the state's table. So that's referential integrity. If you, if you actually had somebody that was from New York, you're gonna have to go to the state's table and add New York. Um, then the state code again there um, is going to, you're going to get an error message because um, on that update, that second update query, it, you're going to get an error message because Massachusetts is not part of the state's code. So you'll have to go back to the state's table and add them in. Okay. Um, and again, now on page two ninety four, those those inserts, that insert and those insert uh, queries and those and the update query this is the bottom of page two ninety four. They work because Oregon and Washington are in the states and we're allowed a, a null value there, which we shouldn't. And really in, in that we should, the null is, is okay, but mm, no. Nah. You see, you have this Carl Logan who has a null value. You see at the top page 295. Now, you don't know if someone forgot to put the information or if Carl Logan, that the state needs to be changed. We just don't know. And that, that, that kills referential integrity. And up there at the top of page 291, they show us two, two, two examples of code where 
we get an error message. Okay. And the error message comes because Massachusetts is not part of the is not part of the state's table and Oregon is capital is is capitalized and you have to be careful about as is California and they walk us through then at the bottom of two uh, of 296 a series of uh, two two update queries where we update the state's table, the state codes, we capitalize them, and then they show up in the client's table. And we change that, we put that value ZZ into those tables. Um, and we'll put in the state name. And then we have the state capital, capital and, the, and they're capitalized. That's there at the beginning table one and, and two, and then the result sets are over there on page 299. Now they talk about setting up reference referential integrity in, in the AXIS GUI, okay? And they show you how to do that in the relationships table. So I'm going to close this off. All right. And we click database tools. Okay. And then we click relationships. Okay. And we have these tables that are together. And I'm going to show you how we set that up. When we look at the table departments and then the employees table, okay, notice how we have the department code, which is the primary key in the department's table, embedded into that list of employees. And there's one to many, meaning one department code, okay that fits because we can have several employees. Now I'm going to click on this link. Now I'm going to click edit relationships and this will show you the edit relationships dialog. And what this says is that the department code in that department's table and the department code in the in that uh, employees table, we enforce referential integrity. In other words, we make them, we they must match. And then we have a thing here that says we can cascade update related fields. So when I update this, it cascades to all of the related fields. That's all, and it just changes all the other records. Now I'm going to click here on join type and it's the join property. It's uh, we're going to only include the rows where the join fields from both tables are equal. Okay. We have the same one to many over here when we look at departments to the employees table again, one to many. And I'll click on this and we'll edit the relationship and it says the department code. These two must match. And that's the join type. And the join type number one is what we call an inner join. Okay. And 
And notice here we have that foreign key because this department key is a primary key here in the department's table, but over in this employee's table, it is a, which is the child, that it is a foreign key, an FK. And there's the PK, the employees, which is the primary key for the employee's table. And they walk you through that using that dialog box and editing relationships. And then the options for updates and deletes. And they show you the code that you have, you have to write in Oracle SQL. I'm over on page 304. Ah, okay. And then talking about the delete ca cascade updates and cascade deletes. And let me say this never, 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 never check <laughs> cascade delete unless you want to really create some havoc. So updating is one thing. Enforcing the refer referential integrity is another. And I'm looking at the, the, the verbiage here and the explanations on page 306 and 307 in your, ta in your textbook. And uh, 309 talks some more about the access GUI, that edit relationships, cascading. And they show you some examples from the ending results from eight queries 819, from query 819. Um, we've done a lookup table. And the authors talk about the two meanings of a primary key. And the, the primary key is what makes a record unique. Now, as they state there over in page 311, okay, uh, it's the noun of the subject of each row. So it is the, it's what creates the uniqueness. Tables uh, can only have one primary key, although that key can consist of several columns. Okay. And they walk you through the developments with that in use of the primary key. That's nice stuff to have and understand. But the, the key part, the, the main thing is you have a primary key. Typically, I'm old school, you would want to have one field that serves as the unique identifier. What they show you there over at starting page 313 using two keys. two or more columns, two or more fields for the primary key. And they talk about coding and constraints in the create table statement, which is a bunch of work. If you take a look at 317, you're gonna see the access SQL method one without naming the constraints, then giving names to the constraints. You can, you should do all of that, should typically be done in the graphic user interface and then using lookup tables. And that takes us back to the key points for chapter eight. So, I'm going to close this jewel, diminish this down for a minute. This is what you'll want to upload if you choose to not write your own code. Go through the book, the, the, the uh, zip file with the code that's written in there. But you have now lunches eight, which we've done here today. 
we downloaded it and I showed you what was in it basically. Now, this will this will pretty much wrap it up. Now next week, lunch is database nine is due, and we'll do that in class. And we'll talk about it. And because it, we're gonna in, we're we're gonna leave the world of referential integrity and we're coming into the world of row functions. And this is where we're gonna start to collect data from rows. We'll see functions that enable us to do that. And then later we'll see functions that enable us to get data from columns. Okay. So that'll pretty much stop, uh, end it for today. So I'm going to stop the recording and then end the meeting.